previously on Coffee with Kenobi. Then I thought, what kind of detail would you have in that, you know, building a planet with Legos, although potential is, is there. That could be, or it could be the, the T-Porg Thousand in the latest Terminator. Oh. The Porganite. <laughs> the Porganite, well, exactly. <laughs> well, now someone's going to do some Photoshopping with a red eye and all that stuff. I can see oh, it happening now. It's got to happen. If- this is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm. I have a good feeling about this. Hello, friends, and welcome to show number 82 of Coffee with Kenobi, your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, enjoying a delicious cup of coffee in my black Star Wars Galactic Knights tumbler from the event at Disney's Hollywood Studios earlier this year. I want to welcome our new CWK family members, and hello again to each of you for joining me each and every week for a cup of coffee and Star Wars conversation. We hope to make you think about Star Wars in a whole new way and maybe laugh a little bit in the process. On today's show, we have plenty of Star Wars discussion and analysis, including an awesome interview with the star of Star Wars Battlefront II and the narrator of the Inferno Squad audiobook, Janina Gavankar, including an in-depth look at What Makes George Lucas Tick, from biographer Brian J. Jones. CWK newsman Tom Gross will bring us the latest Star Wars news. And in the coffee chat, we're going to talk with Din, the lead singer of F-105, to talk about their debut album, which has a heavy Star Wars influence. Music and Star Wars go so beautifully together, so I thought it would be great to catch up with Din and have a cup of coffee and find out what made this album come to life. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, And let's have some coffee with Kenobi. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Joining us today for a cup of coffee are two gentlemen that are returning guests to Coffee with Kenobi. We're very excited to have them both on. The first one I'd like to introduce is the author of George Lucas Alive, Brian J. Jones. Hey, guys. Nice to be here. Nice to be back, I guess I should say. Yes, I'm glad that the brew served you well. You're, You're certainly welcome to join us anytime, as is... The former co-host of Full Sith and one of your podcast favorites, Mr. Bobby Roberts. Uh, hello. Thank you for having me back. And uh, nice to meet you, Brian. Nice to meet you. My pleasure. Hello, hello. And you notice, Bobby, this time you're not a mystery guest. Now now it's all out there. Oh, yeah. Well, no, because well, nobody cares. It's been long <laughs> enough that people are like, "Who? I don't know who the... Oh, he's the annoying guy on Twitter that won't shut up. That guy. <laughs> no, hardly, man. It, you guys are, uh, are must-follow Twitter accounts for sure. Uh, Twitter really exploded about a week ago. Is actually the day we released the last show, which you know that can happen sometimes in the world of Star Wars podcasting. But mm-hmm. the Hollywood Reporter uh, has stated that director Stephen Daldry is in talks to direct an Obi Wan Kenobi film. Now, that being said, I feel like I could get a gold medal in avoiding spoilers, but I could never avoid this whole Kenobi thing. <laughs> and now, since the Hollywood Reporter is, is saying it, I mean, Lucasfilm hasn't confirmed it either way, but when the Hollywood Reporter says it, I mean, you can pretty much count on it. Well, I mean, we knew we knew that they've got a lot of movies in pocket, including the Kenobi movie. You keep hearing about the Boba Fett movie. Now I'm hearing there might be a Jabba movie using some of the Star Wars underworld unproduced scripts and so on and so on. So I'm not surprised. I believe it. Uh, I'm not surprised by it. I have a friend who, uh, the minute it had hit, uh, hit the internet, was just beside himself with excitement, ready to get in line right now. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the, like, like I would say, Lucas gave us a gigantic universe for other creators to go play in with some of these other stuff. So uh, I know... I know there are a lot of people anticipating. I'm not necessarily excited about a Ben Kenobi movie, but I'm also not that excited about a Han Solo movie, which I know is almost heresy, especially as a you know Star Wars Generation One fan. Um, but I I do believe it. Um, I'm I'm sure it's I'm sure there's something something at work on this. Uh, my take is almost entirely based around the choice of a director uh, to, to sort of put this together and not just director, but from what I understand, the talks are, uh, to, uh, to have him also write or at least steer the direction, the creative direction of whatever story is going to be written. And to me, that says a couple things. Uh, firstly, that all the problems they've been having on, uh, on both Rogue One and, uh, the Han Solo movie, um, are, are problems that they actually want to address. And I think some of those problems stem from the fact that both of those movies 
have a lot of hands on the steering wheel before you even get to shooting a, a single shot. Um, Rogue One was a story by John Knoll that ended up getting written by Gary Whitta, that ended up getting rewritten by Chris Weitz, that ended up getting polished at some point uh, by Christopher McQuarrie, that ended up getting rewritten and then reshot uh, <laughs> by Tony Gilroy. So that's a whole lot of hands trying to get a single unified vision that started with, with, uh, with John Knoll, like four years prior right. into, uh, a, a workable shape on the screen. And with Han Solo, you had a story idea that Lawrence Kasdan came up with that. He then got his son to help him write that. He then roped in Lord and Miller to help make. And then Lord and Miller, when they were on the set, had their own ideas as to where the story was going to go. And so you end up with this sort of, uh, confusion, uh, inherent in trying to sort of synthesize all those voices into making something very unified. Now that happens on a lot of movies, obviously, sure. but I, I think that the, the problems that have happened on both those films and the way that um, those problems end up getting out and, and sort of coloring anticipation for the movies might've led them to go, all right, the next spinoff we do, it's one guy. It starts with the one guy. This one guy is also going to be the person making the film. And so there shouldn't be any problems. It starts with him. It ends with him. It's going to be whatever he wants it to be. And the fact that you go and you get Oscar bait Stephen Daldry. This is new ground for Star Wars because they've gone after directors that don't necessarily work in genre. Uh, they've gone after directors who uh, were inspired by and heavily influenced by genre. Right. I don't think they've ever stepped this far out of the box and gotten a guy. Um, I mean, his his filmography isn't uh, you know first rate, but he tries to make uh, serious, emotional, stirring. Oscar bait dramas. That's just the best way to describe his filmography. Sure. Um, and this is the guy they're giving Kenobi to, which sort of tells me that not only are they trying to streamline the story development, I think they're trying to streamline the size of the film. I think this might be the smallest Star Wars movie we get. I don't know why you would get Stephen Daldry otherwise. Smaller than Porgs. Sorry, I had to keep the tradition going from last show. <laughs> um, so a quick question on this, though. Um, do you do either of you are you concerned about the the state of Lucasfilm and what Kathleen Kennedy is doing? Because I'd never really thought of it the way you just said it, Bobby. But with all the, I know that films obviously go through a lot. I mean, Gone with the Wind had had changed directors towards the end of the film, and that turned out beautifully, obviously. Mm. So, does this in, indicative that Lucasfilm is having a little bit of trouble keeping things going, or what is this? I'm not actually as quite as savvy as you guys are on, on the on, <laughs> on analyzing the Hollywood stuff. I I think you know you never know how much of this is. I don't. Know, I sound like a conspiracy theorist when I say this. How much of the strife is manufactured? You know, it's like we you always hear about like they're going back and they're reshooting and then they have to rewrite and Wonder Woman's not finished and it's going to suck and it's the worst movie ever. And now it's no wait, it's a fantastic movie. We take it all back. Um, you know, talking about the auteur, the director, the writer. Now we've seen Ben Affleck drop out of Batman now. So, I mean, these things all seem to sort of happen. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced the ship's adrift. I think when you've got something that's as big as this franchise that matters so much to so many people, uh, I think it does tend to attract, as you were saying earlier, a lot of hands. There's a lot of chefs in the kitchen uh, that all want to play in that universe. I, I think part of it is, is managing... Um, excitement on the part of directors, even and so on, and people that want to play with Star. I mean, you know, Ron Ron Howard taking the helm of Han Solo is actually not a big surprise, given how you know how long Ron Howard's been involved with George Lucas. But you know, when you were reading him on Twitter, I mean, the guy was like squealing with excitement that he was going to get to finally play in George's universe. So, so I think that's the nature of the beast, kind of on these things too. Is you've just got so many people. I think you hear. I think the volume is louder. On these, I'm not actually saying that there's not strife or things to be concerned about, but I think the volume is louder, the scrutiny is deeper than we get on a lot of other movies. So you see it in the Star Wars universe, and you see it in the Marvel slash DC universe, I think as well. It's fair to presuppose yeah. as well that when someone gets the keys to this kingdom, suddenly they just become a little more emboldened because, as you said, this is such a big universe and it means so much to so many people. There's a lot of cloud. I mean, I don't know that it can make or break a career, but it certainly puts you. In another echelon, and you like it to be above rather than below, as as Lord and Miller may possibly be looking at. It's hard to say. I guess it would depend on what happens with Han Solo, you know, in the next couple of years and how it's looked upon by fans. I feel like that's going to be nothing but gold, really. But Bobby, what do you think? Is is Lucasfilm piling the ship correctly? Is this just human nature? 
Uh, I, it's just the movie business. And uh, part, of, part of the I problem... I tend to agree. Uh, yeah, part of the problem with uh, fandom and the movie business is that uh, fandom is built to find narratives in things <laughs> and, and yeah. sort of pick through and sift through those narratives. And one of the most welcoming, comforting narratives that we as fans uh, cling to, and this happens in, in any fandom that you can name, uh, is the, uh, the David and Goliath one. We love to believe that as soon as a director is hired, that they become David and that the studio is just hell bent on messing with them. And part of that narrative, uh, especially as star Wars fans, uh, was, was sort of fed to us at an early age, just by reading books about George Lucas, much like the one, uh, that, that Brian has written. Like that guy got messed with by studios and he didn't get messed with all that much. Not as much, you know, as his friend, uh, Francis did, uh, Francis Ford Coppola got messed with by studios a lot. Um, and he saw a lot of people getting messed with by studios and, you know, reading up on George Lucas, reading up on the film brats of the seventies, that narrative makes sense. The studios are, are money counters. The studios are, are craven. They pander. All they care about are the returns on investment. They don't really care about art. Not like the directors do. Um, but the problem is that narrative doesn't necessarily hold true. And it certainly doesn't hold true a lot of the time. Um, yes, there's, some truth to it, obviously, but just as a lot of fans will immediately default as soon as there's any sort of problem to that narrative. Um, and it sort of trains us to look at how films get made, uh, through that sort of inherently cynical eye. We just assume that we know, uh, the studio has messed it up. And if the director had been left alone, uh, the, the purest, best possible version of creativity would have emerged like, you know, like a, like a beautiful butterfly from the chrysalis or something like that. And that's, that, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes, uh, the director might mean well, the screenwriter might have, uh, the best intentions of making a great movie. Uh, but it takes someone at the studio to step in and be like, uh, this is going sideways. And I don't think you need to keep going down this road. I'm going to put my hand on the wheel for a sec. I'm going to course correct. I'll give you back the wheel. I promise. I swear to God, but you are going to drive us off a cliff like Toonses. And I think what's <laughs> happening right now yeah, that's that's for the forty year olds in the audience. <laughs> the twenty year olds are like, I don't what what is a tune? Uh, YouTube, is that it? YouTube it, friends, you'll love is it. Is that a Simpsons joke? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's the yeah, it's the name of a porg. Uh, <laughs> that's it's, right. The, it's the hero a wicked porg. driver's oh, license. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wicket the Wicket the Ewok and uh, Toonses the Porg. It'll be cool. You'll get a big stuffed Toonses, uh, and don't let him in your car. That's a bad idea. I it's think very we can agree, though. You know, it, like you mentioned, uh, you late went through Bobby. All the things that um, transpired with Row One. At least it didn't end up like Batman Returns. Remember what a disaster that was. They had they had a completely different script during shooting, and that ended up being the colossal disaster. Rogue One was not a colossal disaster. I don't think Han Solo will either. But I want to sh- shift gears really quickly. Do we need mm-hmm. an Obi Wan Kenobi film? We've got John Jackson Miller's book, which is not canon, but is a yeah. beautiful story. Uh, we've got Kenobi's very memorable appearance uh, in Rebels season three against Darth Maul, and then we've got a number of comics in the regular Star Wars series that show us kind of mm-hmm. what has been happening. And, and after a while, can that much really happen on Tatooine without the Emperor noticing? I mean, I guess. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I think I think the necessity of a fictional story is overrated as a metric by which to measure what gets made and what doesn't like, we don't need any of these stories. I mean, technically we probably didn't need the empire strikes back, you know, but I don't think a movie has to justify itself based on whether it's adding new bullet points to the wiki entry, uh, on, on, on the fan page. I think all of film needs to do mythology and like to talk about it in class. Then it <laughs> well, you, you got plenty of knowledge. Yes, the Greeks got you covered, man. You don't need Star Wars for that. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, you know, I don't want them doing the kind of movie either where every single second is another nod and a wink origin story to yes. something. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, I mean, and that was one of, you know, that was one of the uh, moments of, it, you know, when you're watching the prequels, you're like, well, at least they didn't screw up Han Solo. Like, we didn't have to see a Han Solo origin story in there. And I don't necessarily, not sure I need a Han Solo origin story. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, there are certain questions about Ben Kenobi that I'm okay with them being unanswered. And I don't, I don't need to have a nice big bow tied around, you know, Ben Kenobi's story and what he was doing in the deserts of Tatooine for the 20 years and why he aged so much faster than everybody else. I, 
Yeah. I, uh, well, and that's sort of what I'm getting at with the uh, the whole bullet points on the wiki thing. I think if you're making the movie or you're going to the movie and that is your main concern with the film, I can see why this might seem like a big question mark to you, if not disappointing uh, overall. But I feel like the movie justifies its own existence if it executes the emotions of the the, the story well. Pathos. Like if, Yeah, if... if a movie is for me, a movie is a success if it does what it's trying to do well. Now, if what it's trying to do is just fill in backstory, right. that's n- that's not as n- nice an aspiration for me as if, you know, it's just a story that explores the emotions of what it's like to be Ben Kenobi. I don't need bullet points for that. You can tell a 90 to 110 minute story of a very simple adventure. So long as that very simple adventure is emotional uh, so long as it's resonant and so long, so long as thematically it says something and does something that, that makes me feel like well, that to me is what, how a movie justifies itself. Like I don't need to go to a movie to say, okay, well it added six points to, uh, no, the no. Obi wiki page. So right. therefore it was a good movie. I just need, I like, it cannot add a single new data point of information to Obi Wan's wiki. And I will be fine with it. So long as it either makes my chest hitch up, puts uh, goose pimples on my arm or has me reciting very awesome dialogue as I'm leaving the theater. Which, um, which that's what makes would. a successful story. I mean, it has the potential to be like, like the great star Wars Western really, and mm-hmm. I mean, look, our podcast is not called Coffee with Jar Jar. I mean, obviously, we'll be <laughs> we'll be thrilled if there's a Kenobi film. I mean, I'll be as happy as a, the Swedish chef at a porg convention. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there's, uh, it just I think it's worth saying to, because for me, it's porg, porg, what adds porg. <laughs> what adds to the mythology. And I really don't think. Uh, that there have been really too many missteps with the films and uh, the television shows particularly. So I think there, there's a lot of promise there. I still maintain that I can't, under, I can't believe that a, a, a job with a hut standalone would, would be something I'm necessarily looking for, but you know, I can be convinced. Yeah, I see, and that that for me is um, I just don't know if there's any sort of story that even peripheral, peripherally yeah. involves Job of the Hut that either fulfills the, 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 the Wikipedia metric that I don't really like or the uh, storytelling and emotion metric that I do really like. Like there's not much about Jabba that interests me no. or Jabba's circle of friends that really interests me. Like there, there are a lot of genres that can fit within Star Wars. I'm not entirely sure gangster film right. is a Agreed. genre that I'm looking for Star Wars to, to fill. Like that, I, I'm, I'm not saying they can't do it. Like, obviously they can. Um, and they've been pursuing bounty hunter, uh, which is pretty close. It's adjacent to gangster film, uh, for a while. Um, but there I has don't to be a, a way for them to remember that, you know, star Wars said, or George Lucas said star Wars was made, was made for what? 12 year olds. Uh, that, yeah, that, that implies a, a, a sense of joy and whimsy. And, mm-hmm. uh, we don't need necessarily, you know, Game of Thrones or the Godfather, the Star Wars version. I, I think uh, the franchise has, has been very well uh, trucking along with, with that hint of joy. And I feel like a gangster film would sort of take that away. Although this also then brings us back to the choice of Daldry, uh, because Daldry is not a guy that's particularly known for uh, being child friendly either. Um, like I, he obviously wants to stretch out a little because you don't agree to do a Star Wars film if you're the guy that directed, you know, the hours in Billy Elliot. Um, you don't agree to direct a Star Wars film unless you're feeling like you want to maybe stretch out a little or try and you know, go in a direction that you've really never gone before. So they're going to meet in the middle somehow. Cause I don't think he's going to end up making the star Wars version of, of the reader or God forbid, uh, extremely loud and incredibly close. That movie was garbage. Um, yeah. do we have any idea? Is he going to fill in the gap between, you know, episodes three and four, or is he going to go all the way back before episode one? And I mean, have we heard anything on where he we have heard be- nothing? No? Like ev- everyone's just sort of assuming that it's going to, be- everyone's sort of assuming that it's going to be old Ben simply because that's just the that's sure. the obvious choice you and mcgregor fan, wants to come back version, yeah yeah but it could it could be uh you know well, 12 pre phantom menace and we we got liam neeson to, to do his thing wouldn't that be fun oh and or or it could honestly be um a clone war era uh, chapter right uh he's just off by himself because i mean you and mcgregor really hasn't aged 
true. <laughs> and and he was already playing an older guy in episode three anyway. So you, you he could be doing like a Clone War era adventure that he's just separated from Anakin. And actually, uh, speaking of me being on Twitter and never shutting up, um, it occurred to me and I tweeted about it and uh, people seem to get excited about the notion. Um, if you do set it in the later days of the Clone War and it's just sort of like an Obi-Wan solo adventure, uh, not only do you then get the opportunity to possibly uh, cast like a live action Satine, um, but you could, if you're, if you're sneaky about it, uh, sneak in like a, a sixth reel cameo from Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. Wouldn't that be fun? I, I feel like whatever they do, they're going to try to keep it around the OT era because, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the, their bread and butter is. And as much as they're seem to be mm-hmm. a piece of the prequels, I feel like they're not going to shine too much light on that for a while. No, and I, I agree with you. And I, and I even think, I know, I know there's a lot of, Fingers crossed that we're going to start poking into the EU on this, but I'm just I'm not I'm not seeing it in the in the movies either. I, th- I think it's too uh, I think it's too deep drill for you know the Star Wars fans that love to go see them in the movies, but aren't aren't invested in the mm-hmm. you know in the extended universe. So I, I I tend to agree with you on that one. Yeah, I I, I do hope that at some point uh, books from the new canon can and will be adapted. Uh, not just characters being lifted out of old canon and repurposed for for the new storylines, <laughs> but like a legitimately, you know, take Lost Stars and turn it into a ten episode miniseries or something like that. Like I would oh, like, fun. like on Netflix I would or like something. Star Wars to actually start adapting its own fiction into live action. I feel like there's almost like a, a rule against it. Maybe it's like unspoken. I don't think it's codified or anything like that. But I do sort of feel like that's a thing that. I don't know if they want to cross that Rubicon. I don't know if they do or they don't. I would like it though. I would think it would be real cool if, uh, if, if, you know, like bloodline got turned into an animated movie or something. Oh, wow. I think that would, but I don't that, know if that's, that's better than happened. suddenly taking the, the, the relatively new Thrawn novel and deciding to, to adapt it into a comic and that being yeah. your major news. I think they could, I think that not that that won't be lovely. I'm sure it'll be fine, but <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of things you can mine that will produce you know, yeah. finances and fan, you know, service and excitement and add to the mythos. But I guess time will tell. So good. With that, we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, we're going to check in with Brian about an upcoming project and ask him a little bit more about He's George just- Lucas's contributions post Disney. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, pass the cream, would you? Coffee with Kenobi is sponsored by Penguin Random House Audio. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Thrawn and Empire's End Aftermath to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll plan to keep you entertained. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. Coffee with Kenobi is also sponsored by the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play and collect your favorite images from the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens, Rogue One, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. If you're considering a way that you want to help out Coffee with Kenobi, an excellent way to do so is to be a member of our CWK Patreon page. We have so many people who help contribute to the show each and every month, and I'm talking about CWK family members like Tyler Wiggins, Jason Hall, Dennis Keithley, Aaron Harris, Angela Saus, Mediocre Jedi, Chris Hadding, Terry Lee, Jim Capron, Connie Shee, Mike Audette, Adam Leonard, Swara Sala, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco, and Mark Suter. It's an amazing way to help us out with our show expenses, including the RSS feed. You can help us host our webpage, the microphone upkeep, cables, the travel, and everything that goes into that. And then we have a number of incentives, including some brand new incentives that I'm really excited to talk about. With a $5 contribution, you get recognition at the start of each show, like you just heard, and you get a follow from us on Twitter. $10 $10 and up, we have access to our Google Hangout, which is a monthly opportunity. At $35 or more is a coffee mug, all the way up to T-shirts, et cetera, depending on how much you want to contribute. And if you get contribute $50 or more, you could host one show with me, 
two shows with me in a month or an entire month of shows. That's four shows, depending on how much you were able to contribute for that particular time. Now, the news, the big news is we are now a member of Discord. Discord is an app. It's also something you can use on your computer. It's something that gamers use, but it's now something that others can use as well. And Call of Duty Kenobi has a Discord account, and it's really, really cool. Basically, it's almost like message boards just for CWK family members. So you can get on there and discuss anything that comes to mind. Right now we have a Discord one for general. We're just talking Star Wars in the podcast. We have one for Star Wars Rebels because the DVD for Season 3 is coming out soon. And Season 4 should be announced really, really soon as far as when that starts. And then we've got one for Star Wars Collecting, which seems really appropriate for Force Friday. Now... If you and that is something you get for five dollars or more a month. So if you contribute five bucks to Coffee with Kenobi monthly, you immediately get access to our Discord page. And I've just really been getting into it. At first, there was a learning curve for me, and now I've got it. I think down. I've added the app to my phone, so it's easier to communicate that way. And I've had an absolute blast with it. I can't wait to see everyone else get more involved in the conversation and to involve even more people to the conversation as well. Now, if you contribute thirty-five dollars or more a month. Not only do you have access, but you also are able to create your own Discord conversation threads where you can start a conversation of your own and we can all join in with you. So $5 or more a month, you automatically get to be a member of the Discord Coffee with Kenobi page, and that goes all the way up. And then if you contribute 35 or more, not only are you a member, but you can create your own channels for us to have a conversation with. So you're, if you are interested in that, please check out the link in our show notes or on our webpage at the top left for more information. We're back, and I want to catch up with Brian while we have you here having a cup of coffee with Brian. Uh, George Lucas Alive has, has been such a runaway hit. It's a, an excellent book. My brother-in-law, I, I let him borrow a copy, and uh, every time I see him, he raves about it. Uh, what has the reception for the book been like for you? Uh, you know, I've, it, it's been great, and I've been really pleased that I haven't been uh, pile-driven by Star Wars fans because my biggest concern was to make sure I got all the Star Wars stuff right. Um, and, you know, it's partly because I, I'm a fan myself, so I knew how important it was to be sure you get this right. And, and uh, you, you, you know, you try not it, – it, it, it was tough in biography because, like, you're dealing with people who may not know who George Lucas is, but those who do, you want to try to give them stuff they may not have heard before. And that was one of the hardest parts of the book because there are always people who say, oh, we have, it's, we've heard all these stories before. Um, I'm hoping you haven't seen them in context with each other like that before. But the point is um, the, the response has been uh, terrific. Um, actually, the only thing that people really jumped on me for is I got the year of Lucas's Camaro wrong. Um, I said that, uh, that he drove to college in 64 in a Camaro and I've had many people email me and say the Camaro didn't come out till 67. So that has been corrected in the paperback, which comes out in November. Oh, perfect. Well, I, I wouldn't have caught that, uh, in a million <laughs> years. Well, you know, it's, it's funny cause it's one of those things that, you, you know, you, you, as a, as a biographer and a nonfiction, you have to own those mistakes. Cause it's one of those things. A lot of times I, you go check those things. You're like, let me just, let me just double check that. Um, something about that I just let go by because Lucas told that story that way as did his best friend, uh, John Plummer. So it that was one of those, I was like, okay, two people told the story the same way. So I'm just going to ignore the car and I'll worry about the rest of, you know, I, I was more interested in looking at whether, um, he could really pick up a uh, adventure theater on KRON in San Francisco in 1960. You know, you know, that's what I was looking for. Not, not really the year of the Camaro. Oh yeah. And you, you definitely want to quote uh, the person that's the subject of your book obviously a lot more what, what is your opinion on uh, George's feelings since a Disney purchase uh, there's been a lot made recently about him and the fact that uh, Disney didn't follow his uh, treatments for the the sequel trilogy and that completely makes sense I mean they're going a different direction it's obviously gone very very well um, Kathleen Kennedy did say that once in a while he will whisper in her ear about the force and things like that which I really love since he's the creator of this whole universe. I think. Yeah, was, was anyone really was anyone really surprised to hear that? I wasn't. No, not at all. I mean, <laughs> how, how do you how do you imagine the, that kind of kind of going since you know George having done so much you know, research on it? I, you know, I, it's it's got to be tough for him. It's you know they they Disney paid him very well to uh, to go away, <laughs> um, and and you know despite himself he's he's not inclined to do that and. Um, 
And, and I get it. You know, I, I liken it to it's like watching your, you know, watching your child, you know, grow up and, and leave home and you're not in charge of their life anymore, but you'd still like to give them advice and whisper in their ear whether they're going to listen to it or not. I think that's still what he's trying to do with Star Wars. Um, and I think as fans, it, it, what's what's so interesting to me about that is is we still really care what George Lucas thinks of Star Wars. You know, it's like we I think I said this to you last time. You know, I just love when people are like, well, what did he say about Rogue One? Did he like it? And if people hear he liked it, half the fans go, OK, that's great. The creator loved it. So it must be good. And the other half say, well, if Lucas thinks it's good, it probably sucks because look at the prequel. So, I mean, the guy can't get a break. That's true. Um, but, but so, you know, I, I think we're always I think we always still care, uh, you know, what he thinks. Um, but, you know, as far as Disney not using his treatments, um, I I get it. I don't think they I don't really think they should have. You know, it was, it, you read the, the discussions about when he was trying to sell the company and for him to go to the table to to Iger and basically say, yes, I will hand you the keys of the Empire, but I'm in charge of Star Wars. I mean, come on. I mean, he's not right. he's not going to fall for that. Um, and, you know, it was very nice about letting Lucas give him his treatments. But, uh, but I'm not surprised by it at all. Was Lucas hurt by it? Absolutely. I think he felt he got burnt by it. But again, Disney paid him uh, very well to shut up and go away on that stuff. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm in the camp of always being happy knowing that, that he likes the direction of the franchise. And, and I think Absolutely. Star Wars is stronger uh, for what has happened and not because – Good riddance, George, but more because this is just kind of the organic nature of myth anyway. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's been 40 years. It's been a long time. That's a long time for one person to be managing, you know, managing a universe. And I, it's, as, as I said at the beginning of the, of this conversation, I mean, it's, he, he's given us a gigantic universe to play in a gigantic mythology to mess around with. Uh, I think it's time to start letting you know, people my age who grew up with Lucas, we're like 50 now. So, you know, let, let us play in your sandbox finally, George. So I'm, I'm really kind of glad that it's an opportunity for the next generation and the generation beyond that to come along. And, and every generation kind of had their version of star Wars, whether you were raised on the original trilogy or you came into the prequels or your extended universe or you're the clone wars. I mean, every sort of era has had its own version of star Wars. So this is sort of, I think it's, I think it's the natural passing of the baton. I'm, I'm thrilled with what they're doing with it, to be honest. As am I. Bobby, what about you? What kind of vibe do you get when you hear these kind of stories? Uh, my my uh, my automatic is like if, if he was really that concerned uh, with uh, with having any semblance of control over Star Wars, he would have never actually approached Bob Iger to sell the company in the first place. So on some level, even if there is a twinge every now and again, um, he, he don't really want it. If he really wanted it, he wouldn't have sold it. But he he didn't really want it. And I can't blame him for not wanting it because, like you guys just said, can you imagine what it must be like to have that weight on your shoulders for that long, especially when everyone in the world, because it's been so well documented, knows that you were never really wanting that weight. Like you basically, you basically only became the biggest independent studio in the history of film uh, because nobody else would do it. Well, you know, when I, when I was writing the, the Jim Henson biography, um, yeah. the, the Henson family actually said to me, a couple of them said words to this extent, you know, and I was asking them about selling the company. They said, do you know what it's like to get up every morning and wonder what am I going to do with the Muppets? And yeah. and I didn't say this out loud, but my, you know, what I thought was I know plenty of people that would love to have that problem. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing now. You know, Lucas doesn't have that response. He doesn't have to wake up wondering what am I going to do with Luke Skywalker today? But there's yeah. plenty of other people out here, plenty of us dorks who would love to know what's going to happen with us. Let them run with the ball now. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine uh, what that must feel like. I feel like he is probably relieved. I mean, you know, and, and how could you not be anything but happy to see your kids, as, as you used that metaphor previously, to see them all grown up and flourishing in unexpected and in exciting ways. Yeah. I th- I also think it's just sort of like as fans, um, we, and especially some of us older fans, uh, like Brian was saying, uh, I, I feel like as fans, like there's so much of our fandom that is wrapped up in either, uh, getting approval from, or being able to point at approval, uh, from the creator. Oh, we're a lot like droids in that way. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and I think, uh, 
I, I think this this brave new world of Star Wars and uh, the newcomers that are coming to Star Wars fandom uh, are lessening that concern. And it's sort of like it's almost habitual at this point. And a lot of us have got to learn how to break that habit to, you know, stop looking at something Star Wars and then immediately trying to check our work against what we think George might or might not say. Um, and that's just that's just habit. It's force of habit. Like whether or not he liked The Force Awakens, um, did you? Because that's the most important metric there is whether or not it worked for you. And if you are deciding whether or not the film worked uh, based on a weird conception of what you think George Lucas might have thought, um, why would you remove yourself from the equation? Yeah, that's uh, a dead end street. Right. Exactly. And I, th- I think that's where a lot of the discussion about uh, George Lucas and George Lucas's feelings on uh, Star Wars now that he doesn't own it or have anything to do with it. I think that's where a lot of that sort of trips up. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm curious as to what George Lucas would have thought of Rogue One. Sure. But I'm also not going to, uh, try and find that answer out for the sake of then turning around and trying to, uh, tell other people, this is why your opinion is wrong because the guy who made this thing, uh, thinks something differently. Um, like uh, creators can sort of lose the plot. Creators, Mm -hmm. uh, don't necessarily, uh, hold the overall, you know, defense definition of what a thing can be. Um, you know, hip hop is not what hip hop was in 74. Uh, the person who invented scratching, uh, can't do what DJs do today to use like a musical reference. Like if I want to use a, 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 uh, uh, another film example, what Ridley Scott is doing with alien right now, um, is not what a lot of alien fans would think you need to be doing with alien. The creator can, sort of their ideas as to what the story should be doesn't always align with the fandoms. And sometimes the fandom is wrong. Sometimes the fandom might have a better idea as to what it is the story should be than the creators do. That's sort of why the whole death of the author uh, idea still carries weight. You don't want to put a whole bunch of weight on that just in the same way you don't want to put a whole lot of weight in the auteur theory, which sort of suggests that a movie really only belongs to one person. Something as collaborative as filmmaking can never just belong to one person. There are too many voices and too many uh, important uh, you know, uh, factors to, to, to consider to just say, oh, well, this is just that one person. Uh, I don't really buy auteur theory, and I don't really put a whole lot of weight into death of the author, but you need to be able to balance those two things. Take a little bit from one, take a little bit from another, and sort of use your own you know, ideas, your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own emotions, uh, and use that to gauge whether or not the film or the story that you are experiencing worked for you and why it worked for you. Um, don't, don't basically, basically don't check your work against someone else, even if it's George Lucas, uh, to validate your own opinion, try and support your own opinion based on what the film itself is giving you and what you got out of it. And then you won't end up getting in all those fights. Well said, well said. And Brian, I'm, I will get you out of here. Uh, we're going to end this segment on this one. You, your next book that you're working on is another creative genius as well. Uh, yes. Uh, somebody said to me uh, in, in a throwaway comment, which I love, is uh, that I tell the stories of storytellers, which I, I always considered myself the uh, the uh, biographer of the mad geniuses. But somebody said the story of storytellers, which I really like. Uh, I'm writing a biography of Dr. Seuss. Uh, only just starting at this rate, it probably won't come out till 2019. Maybe I think if I'm lucky at this point. Um, but another, you know, just it, what, what I love about, uh, you know, subjects like him and George Lucas and Jim Henson, Washington Irving, I didn't have this quite so much, but I don't have to usually explain who it is. Um, with Washington Irving, a lot of times I say that and people look at me like it was a basketball player, but I don't, I don't run, I don't, I don't tend to run into that with George Lucas or Dr. Seuss, which is kind of cool. So that it's been, as I said, I'm only just starting with the research on it, but it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. And I, I gotta tell you, uh, getting all of his books to go through has really thrown off my Amazon, uh, you know, recommend, recommend. <laughs> You section shows up. They keep saying you may enjoy Go Dog Go, which is probably true, but I don't. I don't really need that suggestion right now. <laughs> oh man, you would enjoy it. By the way, it's good stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go ahead and uh, take a break, and we come back. Tom has news. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, pass the cream. Would you? Mm. 
Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From Han Solo to C-3PO to Admiral Ackbar, you'll recognize all of your favorite characters. Listen to movie tie-ins like Rogue One and The Force Awakens, to book titles such as Thrawn and Empire's End Aftermath, to classic audiobooks like William Shakespeare's Star Wars. With Star Wars audiobooks, you'll have plenty of Star Wars listening to keep you entertained. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com for forward slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App features incredible images from many aspects of the saga, including the original trilogy, the prequels, the Clone Wars, Rebels, The Force Awakens, and Rogue One. It's the quality you have come to expect from Tops. It's also easy to get into and really fun too. Your favorite Star Wars characters, scenes, and moments are in every pack. To get started, download the app for free from iTunes or Google Play, and then be sure to open the app each day for free credits to spend on card packs from the cantina. Plus, if you can't get what you're looking for, there's a place to trade with your friends as you complete your Star Wars collection. And if you're an experienced collector, there are exclusive cards, special inserts, and autograph opportunities for you to enjoy. Don't worry about missing the cards and sets you want either, as you can sign up for notifications right on the app. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops can be downloaded for free from iTunes or Google Play. Be sure to download the app and start your collection today. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops is available now. And remember, these are the cards you're looking for. It's news time here at Coffee with Kenobi, and that means Tom Gross joins us. Tom we got a plethora of things to talk about, don't we? We do. Lots and lots of news this week, so we'll get it started. And hey, after this week, we know one thing about the First Order in The Last Jedi. General Hux and Captain Phasma will have plenty of big guns to face off with the Resistance. New deadly models of two of the most popular machines of war from the Empire, and now the First Order were revealed today. The new Dreadnought warship and the ATM-6 Walker bring the heavy metal to the battle. According to StarWars.com, the Dreadnought is classified as a Mandador 4 class warship, according or featuring two enormous orbital auto cannons for large-scale bombardments and 24-point defense air, anti-aircraft cannons on the surface. Lucasfilm design supervisor for The Last Jedi, Kevin Jenkins, describes the inspiration for the Dreadnought as an armored gunboat with World War II Korean War era design with turrets and rotating guns. Its length is about twice that of a normal Star Destroyer. The ATM-6, all spelled out as the all-terrain Mega Caliber 6, named for the laser cannon on its back, dwarfs the Empire's AT-AT. It appears that the First Order learned a bit from the Empire and didn't want some snowspeeder-sized rebellion oh, craft crap. embarrassingly they bring, bring down, down the walkers. The walkers. So the front, so the front legs, legs of these, of these beasts, beasts are, are heavenly pe- armored and have a much larger base. Actually, Jenkins describes the original plans of the ATM-6 coming from the stance of a gorilla, hard to bring down and stabilizing for its large cannon sitting on its back. Can't wait to see how the resistance counters the First Order on this front. So I'm sorry, could you repeat that whole thing? Just kidding. You did a great job there. There is so much to think about with this. When I saw the image today on the Star Wars show and then on StarWars.com, as you had mentioned before, I thought... It's no wonder they needed to find a myth like Luke Skywalker to come back and help save the galaxy because these things look so gargantuan and so intimidating. I feel like these two things alone are more intimidating than anything we saw in the original trilogy themselves. Totally agree. And I have to say, when I read the story and it talked about the the description of of the gorilla look on the AT uh, M6, I went back and I was like, holy cow, I totally see it now. It's true. Bobby and Brian, what do you two think? Uh, I liked the uh, the the gorilla walkers. Um, yeah. the, it, <laughs> they, they weren't as impressive to me, however, as the uh, the the super. What, what are we calling those again? Dreadnought. Dreadnought. Uh, they reminded me quite a bit of uh, Battle Stars. Like I know they were talking about uh, yeah. you know the uh, the World War II and the Korean War era inspiration, and that makes much more sense. Um, I have no reason uh, to be like, oh no no no, it's not World War II. It is Battle Star. But that was the first thing I thought when I saw the uh, the armaments on this thing. I was like, they 
this is a Star Wars battle star, basically. It's it's like a flattened Dorito with a whole bunch of real mean looking <laughs> guns hanging off of it. Uh, uh, and that that to me tells me that they've gotten Star Wars design right. Uh, because if you aren't able to describe a Star Wars ship by very casually and simply referencing something in the real world and having it make perfect sense, um, you need to redesign that Star Wars ship. Like uh, the uh, the gunships from Attack of the Clones are those big paperclip looking things, those yeah. paper binders. Yes. Uh, you know, the Millennium Falcon is a hamburger, obviously. <laughs> uh, Slave <laughs> One is a pizza, land post. Thought, yeah. Yeah. Slave One is a lamppost, uh, and and this thing is uh, a Dorito with uh, you know uh, X Men guns hanging off of it. It's it's amazing. It's cool. Does that and make so the X Wing a stapler? Oh no, nah, no. Nah, the X Wing is actually a bunch of a uh, 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 paper towel tubes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, go. so like one real long paper towel tube, and then like two real short toilet paper tubes stuck to it, um, and then. <laughs> Well, the, the, anyway, I don't, anyway, I don't anyway, know how to follow that one up. Cool. That's good. Um, the ATM <laughs> six, uh, even like the images on Star Wars dot com. I mean, the way it, it moves, I, I picture it being much more fast. Almost like, you know how when the, that Brad Pitt zombie flick came out, all of a sudden zombies were fast. I feel like mm. the ATM sixes are really going to move. See, the thing that I'm wondering about um, is the way that its front legs uh, fold behind yeah. it. It seems to me like either those front legs are going to be used, like you said, either for for like running or climbing, or this might be the first uh, at at uh, that stands up. Like I can see that thing rearing up on its hind legs and using those front legs to either swat at or (laughs) knock down something that's flying around it. That's, that seems to me like you don't introduce that design element. If you're not looking to take advantage of it somehow, because the back legs still look like normal at, at legs. So the front legs have to do something different that we haven't seen. And either those front legs are going to help it climb Mm -hmm. and, and a climbing at, at is frightening all by itself, or it's going to rear up to twice its vertical height and start swatting at things like King Kong. And either of those options uh, makes me smile. I'm hoping sure. one of those two options works. Well, both of these vehicles, they look like um, something that people who idolize the Empire uh, were yeah. just obsessed with the Empire, and they took it, and they did almost like they made it into like some sort of a nightmarish version of the, of the previous incarnations. And I actually feel like when we're sitting in theaters watching The Last Jedi, we're going to feel a whole new kind of peril for the heroes because these things are really intimidating. Yeah, and the Adat was always a poorly designed weapon, I always thought, anyway. So they got to do something that makes it look more practical, because Lord knows the uh, the ones from Empire certainly <laughs> certainly looked like it was a poorly designed weapon. Slow and lumbering and can be brought down by string. So, <laughs> <laughs> What I also like, one of the uh, the little design touches that I like with the, uh, the Gorilla Walker is yeah. that uh, the head of it, uh, it now has like a Fu Manchu mustache. Oh, see, I saw that as fangs when the stuff he's telling me. Oh, see, you saw fangs, and I saw like a biker mustache. So, like our our <laughs> I saw a mustache vision, too, like a like a orangutan. Yeah, like so, our visions of intimidation are different. Apparently, yeah, Dan see, is scared like of a, giant. I yeah, like Dan red, is scared of giant monkeys. You're scared of vampires. <laughs> I'm scared of bikers. I feel so. like a red, a red squinty eye and fangs. So that's why I see. If that. you combine yeah. those three, we could have the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing. That's good. <laughs> As long as it's not a transformer, that's what we're waiting on, right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, what I have to say in the interview on StarWars.com, Kevin Jenkins all but says, in my eyes, in my reading, that this is going to be a faster moving uh, craft, the, a- the ATM 6, than the original um, Empire Strikes Back. Intimidating yet slow at it. Well, moving on, uh, Disney tweeted this week that the highest point in the Star Wars Galaxy Edge at Disneyland Resort was put into place. In a video that accompanied the tweet, Walt Smith of Executive Construction Management, Walt Disney Imagineering, says that it is the tallest point of the steel structure and it is part of the underlying structure of the rock work that will be about 200,000 square feet. And the high point stands at 130 feet. Alexa Garcia, ambassador of Disneyland Resort, reports that they invited all cast members from the resort to come and write their names, well wishes, and show their excitement for the project on the steel structure. Included in the signatures and well wishes are sketches of Mickey Mouse, Yoda, a goofy Darth Vader, and 
that would be the goof, the character Goofy, uh, Darth Vader, and messages <laughs> such as <laughs> messages such as Han shot first. May the Force be with you, and judge me by my size, do you? As if Star Wars fans needed one more thing to be all excited about, I believe our cups of coffee are about to overflow. Nice. Oh, absolutely. And I like that Disney is updating this to this kind of degree because they know how hungry we are, we are for information on on this brand new addition to the Disney parks. Guys, uh, are you excited about Galaxy's Edge? I, I totally am. They cannot get this thing done fast enough. And yet once it is done, I probably won't go near it for a year and a half because the crowds will be insane. But I <laughs> am so psyched for them to get this finished. Bobby, are you are you going to come out of, of the the Roberts Cave to go to Galaxy's <laughs> Edge? I have never been to Disneyland or Disney World, um, and I I get the sense. Um, and it, this was hard for uh, you know huge Disney nuts like uh, both Brian Young and Amy Ratcliffe when we were all full of stuff together to to handle. But like I was like, I, it's probably never going to happen, guys. And that and that that appeared to like break their hearts. Like that, I, I I could hear their chests hollow out as the spot where their heart used to be just sort of. <laughs> dissipated in a puff of ash but um you know i don't i don't knock anyone's love of disney and it seems like it's all sorts of fun but it also seems like and i'm just going off you know uh me having lived with me for about 40 years now uh my personality uh would probably cause me to lose any and all sense of fun uh within five minutes of being surrounded by the hordes at disneyland like that i would i would become a very miserable angry little troll of a human being uh, like the, the vision of me that a lot of people who get in fights with me on Twitter have in their head is the me that would actually be walking around the streets in Disneyland just because I don't know if I can handle that many people uh, all at one time getting in my way nonstop like that would kill me. What if we could get you to go through it in an ATM six? Would that help? <laughs> <laughs> That would do it for me, because yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. The crowds. I've. I've uh, I was at Disneyland as a child at 10 years old on New Year's Eve, and that crowd was enough to scare me for the rest of my life. Uh, large <laughs> crowds are not my thing. However, I have to say, in the video I referenced at the very end, they show the this the the structures that they have built, and then they overlay the final design drawing of it, and it's oh, you guys, it's it looks so cool. It's going to be hard to keep me away from that. Oh, yeah. No, just from like an architectural standpoint, it is fascinating to me. Like I do keep up with the news coming out of it. Um, I couldn't avoid it if I tried. Um, And just just the scale of what they're attempting to do um, and to make it so real that when you walk around inside of it, you actually do sort of get lost if you're not constantly reminding yourself that you're at a theme park. Um, That is admirable as hell. Um, And I am very admiring from a distance without you know, ever wanting to actually be inside of it and spend the money for that. Um, I am, you know, sort of flabbergasted by what they're attempting to do here and how successfully they appear to be pulling it off. Like that's nuts to me, but the, the Imagineers at Disney are, are not to be uh, trifled with. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen those clips, uh, from what they're doing with avatar land and avatar is a film series, um, that I could care even, uh, I, I cannot care about it. I just can't. It, I am apathetic to Avatar. Uh, I saw it once in theaters, um, and that was good. I don't like hate it. I don't dislike it. It's just there's nothing about it that appeals to me beyond that first gimmicky screening of it in 3D. The but, same way. but seeing what the Imagineers are doing with that Avatar land is is more awe inspiring to me than what Cameron actually did on screen. Like seeing the animatronic versions of the Navi moving and interacting with people, that is mind blowing to the point where I'm like, if James Cameron with these avatar sequels wants to actually blow people's minds, what he needs to do is show like a three minute trailer um, and then pop up at the end of the trailer and do his, you know, egotastical uh, James Cameron thing. Uh, And, and, drop the bomb on them after this trailer is released. Nothing you saw in that trailer was CGI. It was all animatronics and matte paintings. Like that would be the thing that would get me hyped up about an avatar sequel is finding out that James Cameron made it look like the first avatar, but he didn't use a lick of computer generated imagery. That would be a mind blower. And then I see what Disney is doing and it feels like that's actually within reach. Like you could do that now. Um, So isn't Cameron making like, 10 more Avatar films and they all have the Joker in them or am I confusing things? <laughs> <laughs> but the, Now, the real question here is, is, is everybody going to call it Galaxy's Edge or are you going to be like me and just refer to it Star Wars Land? 
It's hard not to call it Star Wars Land because I <laughs> just, like, be I just like the Wars sound Land. of it. It's just so simple. It's Lego can tell me they're Lego bricks and toys all they want, and it's always Legos. I'm sorry. It's, mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, moving on, it is not unusual for Star Wars to steal the spotlight in theaters and other entertainment realms. But at this year's sold out 50th annual Gen Con in Indianapolis recently, Fantasy Flight's Star Wars Legion did just that. Legion is a brand new hobby miniatures game that was demonstrated in front of long lines at the convention on stunning dioramas of what appeared to be Endor and Tatooine. It is a points-based war game at the base, and the base set has 33 figures that make up two 500-point teams of Imperials and Rebels. According to a designer and game player, Alex Davey, the game moves quickly and units are constantly in motion. It also stays true to Star Wars lore as an example, speeder bikes are quick and good for flanking, but if they cannot complete a move they hit the terrain and have a good chance of exploding on the spot. Each team must field a commander and two units come in the base set and oh yes, they would happen to be Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. The game has an expected release date of early 2018 with the price tag of $89.95. All right, a couple of things on this. And when I saw this, Tom, you were the first person I thought of because of your affinity for tabletop games. One, oh, yeah. I, I heard recently that Fantasy Flight is is about to lose the Star Wars license. Had, you, had any of you heard that? I have not. Because, I mean, if they are, they're certainly going out with, with quite a bang. When I saw <laughs> these images, I, I kind of metaphorically grabbed my head and thought, oh, no, these are so cool. Now I have to get them. But... I'm not going to paint them. They would look awful. I mean, I'm pretty sure that my four-year-old <laughs> could paint them a lot better than <sighs> I could. And so that's that's a bit of like, hmm, but they look exquisite. They look like a ton of fun. I will say the pictures that came from, we've, we've put them onto the uh, Coffee with Kenobi Twitter feed. I saw it reached a couple times today. Um, the, the images from the, uh, I'm trying to see here, the Polygon website from the Gen Con, these the fig- just just the figures alone are stunning. Yeah. But the dia- but the dioramas they built are phenomenal and so realistic looking and just they I mean it, it, it put gameplay aside these is just little miniature art pieces around the house. I don't know they, they I, that would never happen in my house but just in my dream house. <laughs> You know, these would be awesome pieces to put in a, oh, let's say a little curio or a cabinet with glass shelving or something like that. These are so cool. But Dan, you're right. My skill, I would have to, I would have to hire somebody to paint them for me. Oh, I mean, they look sort of like the Disney Infinity figures. Now, I mean, less cartoony, hmm. a little more, a little more realistic. Bobby and Brian, did you see either of those? And do either of you play any kind of games like this? Uh, I don't play the tabletop. I usually like, you know, to look at the books and look at the art and something, but I never actually play them. But if I want my speeder bike to explode, I'll play Lego Star Wars. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not much for the tabletop games myself either. Um, most of my most of my gaming is uh, computer based, uh, but I do really like those uh, those miniatures. And uh, whenever I'm at uh, my local comic shop, um, there's always a big fat glass shelf full of them, <laughs> um, and I make sure to stop by and. Um, I, I look at them. I, I don't I don't spend money on them because I have enough knickknacks. Uh, I'm not much of a collector, but somehow there's a whole bunch of plastic Star Wars stuff littering my desks. Um, <laughs> so I try if that's happening without me actively trying to do it. Um, the minute I break the seal on that, like I, I feel like the house might it's collapse. Over. So I'm, yeah. I'm 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 keeping a lid on that. But I do definitely uh, stop and, and admire them, you know, pick them up move them around in my hands and they're 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 really cool looking well the the last star wars game that i played that was like because i don't have any tabletop games that are sophisticated anyway that don't involve sorry but yeah the last one i played was <laughs> uh the hoth ice planet adventure game from from kenner in 1980 and, and i had a ball with that but <laughs> this is like a whole other level of strategy and, and oh, yeah. Tom, i'm assuming this will be good for uh for a game club at school right 
Oh, absolutely. This these games are awesome. I mean, I, I've played Imperial Assault and the X-Wing games and uh, the Star Wars card game and all of those. And they're so there's first of all, they're really intricate. And for something like my game club where I'm, I'm teaching students the intricacies of socialization and how to play a game and all that, they are so awesome. But I will say on top of all of that, they are just once, once you learn how to play some of these games, they are so much fun to play. And you just get, and we've said this before on the show. I just love the fact that that I and or that me and 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 friends can just recreate some of these Star Wars stories in sort of our own way uh, with these games. And this game, and this this battle, this uh, Legion game, just oh, it, just it brings back the story in such great detail. And then you get to have your own battles. And and I, I will say this very quickly before we move on to the last story. As doing the doing the uh, Gen Con read through of this of this game, um, one really cool facet of this is when the Darth Vader figure comes out. He doesn't even really have to do anything because there are certain levels of roles that he has like aura influence that could potentially just make the rebels turn and run. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, how true. true is that? I mean, you think about the end of Rogue One, they just run in, in terror from his reputation. And so in this game, when you play that character, you better have your Luke Skywalker close. Otherwise, everybody's running for the running for the hills. <laughs> It'd be a lot of fun to be on that side. Well, <laughs> To wrap things up, in news from the Han Solo film, Michael K. Williams revealed in Vanity Fair that the name of Amelia Clark's character in the film is Kira. Williams, whose character has been removed from the film because of scheduling conflicts with reshooting since Ron Howard took the helm, revealed the name when he described his character as a go-between for Han Solo and Kira. Interestingly, though, Jedi News points out that Kira was the name used during the early filming for The Force Awakens to apparently refer to Rey. Which that is true. I do, rem- I, I do remember that being uh, one of the uh, the earliest spoiler reports. Uh, everyone basically called uh, Rey Kira for about a year and a half straight. That's right. I, I'd forgotten yeah. about that completely. I, I, when do you think we're going to see a trailer for this thing? I guess they, haven't, they haven't really finished filming it so maybe it'll be a while but yeah it'll pr- well i what's the release date i don't even know what the release date's supposed to be at this point it's may yeah they're, may. they're not they're not gonna move it back they're they're dead set on getting back to uh summer for some star wars films uh which i'm not entirely sure they should do um it seems to be working very well in december but we're also fast reaching a point where uh the idea of seasons at the box office doesn't right. make any sense like when you can get 250 and 300 million dollar uh blockbuster films in february in april uh in september uh you don't really need to you know cluster around summer or cluster around winter in order to maximize your uh your income you can just drop a movie whenever uh but i believe uh lucasfilm is very much about not having the marketing overlap so you're probably not going to see a trailer for han solo or even much of a marketing presence at all uh until at least a month after uh episode eight is in theaters if not a little bit longer um han solo is going to have a truncated marketing campaign i'm betting simply because they don't want people confused as to which star wars movie they're supposed to be going to the theater for especially (laughs) since there's only a six month turnaround as opposed to the year between the the force awakens and rogue one yeah, so they're they're probably going to compress it. They're going to hit it hard, uh, hit it fast. Uh, it'll be a different kind of uh, Star Wars marketing campaign than the ones uh, we've been used to uh, ever since you know Episode One first came back in '99, where we got these slow year and a half long rollouts where we get uh, you know treated to trailers and and TV specials and and new minute long commercials and uh, international ads and those sorts of things. I think it's just going to be like you get three months. Um, and we're going to drop two trailers, uh, some posters, and it's all going to hit us as fast as possible. The fact that that's happening on the Han Solo movie, I don't know, everything about that Han Solo movie is now just sort of iffy. Um, and it's it's just questionable in a way that I don't even think Rogue One was, even with all that that weird hand-wringing that was going on huh. about Rogue One. With, with Han Solo, it's going to be... Uh, a really big question mark right up until those early screenings uh, happen and the reviews start dropping, uh, and then we'll we'll see what's what. See, I, I'm far from a from a Star Wars sycophant. Obviously, none of us are. But when when I the more I see from Ron Howard, just the way he's releasing these little images and just knowing that the care they're putting into this thing and, and the fact that 
Chewbacca, and you've got the, the same actor who was in The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, which, of course, makes sense. I feel really strong about this one, more than, more than I expected I would. I, I mean, obviously, I mean, last week, uh, Mark and Mike were, uh, mentioned their concerns that Han Solo is a risky film because you could screw it up because he's such a beloved character. But I feel sort of the opposite. I feel like, I mean, you, they're not, we're not just going to accept anything, but I feel like we're really going to get a really strong film that, that is going to knock our socks off. I agree with you on that, but there's, I, but there's a time I, there's some times that I like question how I'm feeling because I'm wondering, is it because I'm still riding the high of the un, unknown expectations of Rogue One and then being so happy with that, mm-hmm. that, that I'm expecting just as much from Han Solo, or is it that I truly believe that this is going to be something special? And I, I want to believe that's going to be truly something special, you know, with Ron Howard on and this list of young actors that just sounds really cool. And they're doing a great way of, of sort of teasing us with the, with the, uh, the Twitter bits. So I, I do quite, I, I do feel the same way as you do, but then I, I think back and is it, is it the rogue one or is it something special that's coming? Well, the standalone films, I don't even with Rogue One, I didn't expect anything. I feel like those are just gravy. As long as the episodic ones hit right. grand slams, I'm at peace with whatever. And Brian, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say I, I tend to agree with you because I'm. Look, I was not terribly excited about a Han Solo movie, as I was saying at the beginning. And it, and you know, it, I, I actually wasn't all that familiar with the work of the director. So when they weren't in, you know, when they announced they were not, I didn't have any deep vested emotion in it. But I have to admit, when they brought in Ron Howard and watching, like you were saying, uh, Thomas, like Ron, watching Ron Howard's kind of enthusiasm for it, I, it started, it did make me start to feel a little bit better about it. I actually got a little bit more excited about it. I thought, okay, well, maybe this is in pretty good hands here from somebody that kind of gets it. And, and again, I, I do think it gets back to a little bit that, you know, Ron Howard comes out of, I mean, you know, he's in the, the George Lucas inner circle, you know, since all the way back in 1972. So, um, so I think I think he gets it. I think he feels sort of the weight and responsibility of managing the franchise or a piece of the franchise on his shoulders. So I'm actually I, I'm actually feeling better about it now than I was when it was announced. I was not terribly excited about it, and now I'm now I'm a little more I'm <laughs> I'm warming to it much more than I thought I would be. Which is super cool. There's there's a there's a lot I think to digest, and, and there's a, there's a part of me that is a little bit. Uh, remiss about the fact that we have a six month gap between films. I, I like. I would be happy with the three years between, like they did for the the first six. I know that's never going to happen in this modern era of, of entertainment. But, I mean, again, we just we just wait and see uh, how it all turns out. Bobby, you think this these um the shorter gaps? You think they'll be uh, good or bad? I mean, I guess with Marvel it's been okay. Although I will say my level of excitement when I go to a new Marvel film is not the same as it used to be, even though I still enjoy the movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that largely depends on uh, not so much the the space of time between when the films come out, but how much time uh, the films have to gestate, uh, how much time uh, they have to get made. Um, like if you can stagger the production schedules in such a way that it takes, you know, two and a half years to really put together a solid action adventure, sci-fi fantasy film. Um, if you stagger the production such that you can knock one of those out every six months, um, audiences are going to treat them like uh, special edition television shows, which is basically the, the production model uh, of a uh, blockbuster Hollywood as it is. Um, as while we weren't looking, uh, it turned out that the, uh, the mini series model from television that we all grew up with, the, those cheesy, uh, low budget uh, shot on cardboard TV mini series. Um, when you pour 150 to 200 million dollars into each episode of one of those, uh, suddenly people really like miniseries. Uh, and, and that's essentially what, uh, you know, the studios are doing. Everyone's trying to find a cinematic universe and cinematic universe is just basically, uh, Hollywood speak for, uh, you know, 10 episodes, yeah, 10 episode television show. Uh, that's basically all it is. And, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's cool. And I think it's very obvious that the way we as people consume media now, uh, we're, we're fine with that as well. It's sort of something that we're hungering for. Netflix helped change the game. Marvel helped change the game. And the way that we consume media and the way that we interact with our stories has changed enough in the past 20, 25 years that the idea of there being like three films – and a trilogy is this grandiose experiment in storytelling that takes nine years to finish. Um, that's obviously in the past now. What we're 
perfectly okay with 16 films in the space of uh, nine years, uh, one coming out every seven and a half months on average, each one taking $150 million to, uh, to pay for. Um, and so long as the quality is good, so long as the sort of a uh, producer first mentality where uh, there's uh, a showrunner, and then there's a writer's room and then there are directors that you trust to bring the vision of the showrunner and the writer's room to life. Uh, as long as that pyramid is flowing <laughs> and built solidly, uh, people will come back over and over and over again because it's the thing that uh, you can – even a podcast audience is, is perfect proof of it. Uh, audiences will prefer consistency over uh, – you know high, high quality every time they would prefer if high, high quality and consistency were married. Uh, but if you had to do an either, or, um, if you turn out a consistently good product, um, every eight months between, uh, if you had to choose between that or having to wait five years for the hope that something really, really good is going to show up, uh, people will tend to go for the consistency. And I think that's what we're looking at here. We will go ahead and take uh, another break, and when we come back, we're going to chat with Din, the lead singer of F-105. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Better than one of those coffee chains, it's Coffee with Kenobi. Coffee with Kenobi was sponsored by Penguin Random House Audio. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Thrawn and Empires in Aftermath to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Visit penguinrandomhouseaudio.com slash Star Wars for sample clips and to start listening now. Coffee with Kenobi is also sponsored by the Star Wars digital card trader collecting app from Tops. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play. From the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens, Rogue One, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. For today's coffee chat, we have Din, the lead singer of F105, with us. Uh, thanks for so much for coming on the show and having a cup of coffee with me. Oh, it's great to be here. I uh, I'm literally having a coffee right now, Dan. So I'm prepared. I'm glad. I I love it. That's that's the way to go, man. As is um, you and your talents are, are just uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, such such a great part of Star Wars fandom is how people take their talents and their passions and they combine them into the Star Wars galaxy. So tell us, if you will, about your history as a Star Wars fan. So my Star Wars fandom would have happened uh, probably in 78 or 79. I mean, I was born in 75. I don't remember seeing A New Hope in the theater, but I remember seeing Return of the... We had a copy. We had VHS copies. My dad was really hooked up at the time to... I don't know who... But we had um, widescreen versions of the trilogy, and I got Return of the Jedi even from him. I remember him bringing it home in like 82, 83, like soon after the movie. And I watched that so many times I knew Return of the Jedi off by heart. With my little brother, we'd go to bed and just sort of go through the whole movie together, try to do every line. We watched that VHS so much. Um, I cried in the theater for movie I ever saw in a theater was Jedi, I think, and I cried when Yoda died and when Luke saved Darth and Darth saved Luke, yeah. So I was really touched. Um, and then just all, like every other every other one of us, just totally mind-blown by this Star Wars thing. It was the greatest thing in the world. Like, nothing compared at that age and still doesn't. Yeah, and the way that it reinvents itself over yeah. and over again, it, it just it's always fresh, isn't it? It is, and it's gone to a point where it's like, I just want to be as healthy as possible so I can live long enough to see as many movies and shows as I can. Because, <laughs> I mean, who would have thought that we'd be getting all this? It's like, oh, well, because I know I'm going to be 85 years old and I'm I'm still going to be, like, trying to avoid spoilers, but at the same time, like, really excited about seeing the next film. Oh, yeah. By then, I'll have to, like, come, I'll have to be, like, 
prune juice uh, with prune face or something because I'll be still older and talking about you know Star Wars all the all the way, man. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so music and Star Wars. That was Odyssey. good. <laughs> uh, that, that was quick. <laughs> I'm impressed. Hey, man. Uh, and I'll and I'll make sure to buy some prunes too. Yeah, to, when, when if you have me on then. There you go. Hopefully, you won't need them if you catch my drift. So, music and Star Wars go so beautifully together. Yeah. Which is one of the many reasons why F105 is such an exciting new project. How did F105 get started? Well, the two people that that um, were the souls really wasn't a full band of um, equal members. Um, there was a few hired people and I had always in my heart. I mean, I just wanted to do, I wanted, I want a band of equals where we, we share every, the songwriting together equally and just, you know, that whole band of brothers thing, but I hadn't had it. So I, the souls, um, was a 15 year thing where I just, I kept pressing along with different members sort of in and out. But two of the people, um, Mark and Alex, we were on tour with the Stoles two summers ago, and we realized we got along so well, and we worked so well together that we decided to start a new project as equal members. The funny thing is, is that uh, last night we played. We're looking for a bassist to join, so it's Mark, Alex, and I at the moment. We were hiring a bassist until sort of someone fits right. But the guy we played with last night, he's definitely the best we've ever played with. And we got along really well, and it turns into doing Star Wars, so that's good. Yeah. Um, when I first got into doing Star Wars music, my bandmates thought I was kind of crazy. Because they're like, okay, now he's not talking about it every, not only every second on tour, but now it's infiltrating our song set. <laughs> but then the song, you know, we that the, the RFR song just did so well that, you know, they're fully on board now. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's 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 definitely creating a great buzz. Um, your website describes your sound as being influenced by roots music, Finnish music, indie acoustic, folk, alternative country, blues, psychedelic, and even a tinge of new wave. Talk about how you find your or found your musical style, and how does it relate so beautifully to Star Wars? I think anyone finds their style by just loving what they love. Like everything that you just mentioned there, aside from the Finnish music is something that we're adding into F105, uh, the first album. About half of it, we'll, we'll experiment with a finished stringed instrument, the cantala, which, um, because Tolkien was inspi- inspired by the Finnish mythology, uh, the Kalevala, and the Elven, the old Elven language was written um, based on the Finnish language, because there's so much Finnishness in The Lord of the Rings that Howard Shore added the cantala to the soundtrack in places. And... Um, so we just, and it has a mythic feeling. So, you know, we're really trying to, with the songs um, that are that are especially Star Wars inspired, they're also universal, um, and they're they're trying to be mythic in a universal way that's not specific to Star Wars, yet in tone can feel Star Warsy and make you recall Star Wars instantly, but then also work as just general metaphors um, for regular audiences. And um, so anything mythic, but the Cantala, yeah. So our first album will come out in two halves, first half in the spring and and in the fall and second in the spring and the second half of the finished. uh, um, But I think you just get your, to answer your question, you just get your style. Um, A teacher once said to me when I was in art school that you only find your style by working every day and working really hard and actively not trying to develop your own style, but maybe more not always trying to mimic someone else. And if you just work at it all the time, your own style will come out. And I think that's what happened. We've, we've been at it for 15 years. Well, I mean, it definitely shows. And, and I agree with you. Anything that you love, anything you're passionate about, anything especially creative. And, and, I, and I definitely feel like this is true about writing as well. You just have to do it. And you tend to take on some of the characteristics of your favorites some of the weirdest influences come from places that aren't even even music like you were saying you know, uh, i think bruce for some reason bruce lee is someone i've been thinking a lot about lately how you know he was very relaxed um in the way because i studied his school for a couple years oh wow so he came at it from a very cool place but from that cool and relaxed place it can happen he called it it which is when you've trained so hard you don't happen it happens so from that 
from that cool, pl- I try to, I try to get our band to be like Bruce Lee on stage. <laughs> cool. And then we let it happen when it, when it wants to happen. Well, it's, it's very Qui-Gon too, right? Feel, don't think, use your instincts. Exactly. Yeah. And you just have to practice enough or write enough in your case. So you, um, obviously you're a huge Star Wars fan. What are some of your favorite aspects of the Star Wars saga? My gut response to that is it's daringness. Um, well, that's cool. Tell me about that. That permeate, permeates everything. Well, when you think about how just, you know, right from the start, George Lucas dared to, he was like, I'm going to make this Flash Gordon style thing for kids and no one's doing it right now. And he was thinking, oh, there's, we don't have a myth in our culture. You know, maybe I can do an, do an experiment to make uh, to make a myth. Actually, George said dare to be great. So, yeah, he likes that word, too. And um, just, you know, everything from the first shot, during, like having a big triangle go over screen for a minute, you know, um, to then rewriting the whole script with uh, the hero's journey. Um, and that tradition, he, I mean, I have so much respect for him because he did that with every movie. He dared to just really go new places every time he did one. Absolutely. And, and like, the mythology is so strong, and it, it's got this... Uh... One of the things I think is so great is one of the uh, reoccurring themes is just, you know, that you have greatness in you and, and all of us have something special that we can add, whether it be to the galaxy or to our own actual, you know, our own reality, our own culture. And um, it's something that you're definitely doing, too. What kind of advice do you have for people if, if they have a particular talent or uh, something creative in them and they want to use that uh, for Star Wars or just for their passions in general? Oh, yeah. Um, when I was starting out, um, and at the time in the creative field, it was visual art, and someone you know, took me up for a walk, and he, he said, here, here, here's this old wall. And he drew something on it, and he's like, who wins? And I go, I don't know what you're talking about, man. He goes, I do, because I build the space. He's like, that's all you have to do every day. And that's the only advice I could really give to anyone. I mean, that's all really Picasso did, too, is he just worked. Or you just paint it every day. You try to make a painting every day. And if you love it, don't waste a day not doing it. I mean, it's not a waste of time. If you love something, you're going to enjoy your time, and eventually you'll get there. Well, that's, that's really inspiring. And I think uh, what goes along with that is uh, you, if there, whenever there's that voice inside you that says, you know, I don't know if I can do this, I'm not sure, I'm having writer's block, or I'm not feeling very creative today, that's when you have to to be even stronger and believe in your passion, believe that you have something to contribute. And I think that's what Luke Skywalker did, right, on Tatooine. That's what, what Anakin did. Obviously, um, he had a bit of a mixed bag of success, but and that's what Ray does too. Every We take these cues, and, and they take the cues just from the culture, the fact that, you know, you can be your own worst critic or you can definitely fall into the trap of, of listening to people saying, you know, saying no, but you fight through that and you don't let that penetrate what you believe to be true. And that is uh, following your gut, following your passions. And you do that uh, beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. And I owe so much of that to Star Wars probably, you know, for my whole life because um, it's just, it's always inspiring me to, to want to make stuff, you know, it just doesn't stop. Yeah. Um, I think that what you said though, about that comes into daring too, which is like you, there was a time where they called the pain period, I guess, in, in weightlifting or bodybuilding where you're working out so much, but you don't seem to be getting anywhere. And that's where, you know, I found people telling me like, Oh, maybe you should quit. Cause it's not sounding very good. You're not making money. But there was that internal thing that I think is very star Wars, which is always just saying like, eventually I'll get there. Exactly. And that was hard because there were real moments where I really wanted to quit, but didn't. Exactly. And uh, Star Wars fandom is better for it. So uh, where can Thank people... You. Oh, man, absolutely. <laughs> it's easy to tell the truth. Where can people purchase your album and where can people find you online to ask you a question or just say hello? Uh, well, I, I'm active. I'm the social media uh, manager, for lack of a better word, for F105. So uh, Facebook.com slash F105 music, Twitter dot com slash f105 music instagram f105 music and uh any one of those i'll respond on and then there's our website www.f105music.com 
And uh, Rebel Girl, the new song Rebel Girl is all over those sites too. It's getting a lot of great buzz, and you've been uh, really making the rounds talking about it. So we are just uh, delighted and honored to have you on Coffee with Kenobi. You are welcome back anytime. Oh, thank you. I'd be happy to be back. take this moment to thank our CWK sponsors, Penguin Random House Audio and the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. Please support them the way they support our podcast. And remember to listen to new and archived shows of Coffee with Kenobi wherever you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Player FM, our website, www.coffeewithkenobi.com, or wherever you enjoy listening to your favorite shows. And if you listen to the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. 
You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr, and we'd love for you to check us out there. Be sure to listen to our CWK family of shows too, including Legends Library, Rose Reactions, Comics with Kenobi, and Lattes with Leia. A big thank you to Brian, Jay Jones, and Bobby Roberts for having a cup of coffee with us today. And gentlemen, where can listeners get in touch with each of you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello? And definitely feel free to, to plug anything that you've got going on because people love what you both do. Brian, let's start with you. Uh, you can find me goofing around on Twitter most days uh, at Brian J. Jones, B-R-I-A-N-J-A-Y. Go ahead and spell it out, J-O-N-E-S. If you look for Brian Jones, you'll find the dead Rolling Stone. Uh, so you can find me there. My website's brianjjones.com. But uh, again, look for me most days on Twitter. I'm tending to uh, get in trouble and shoot off my mouth over there. Uh, I am uh, Bobby Roberts PDX on Twitter. Uh, and you, if you talk about Star Wars, you're going to find me. Uh because that's just I I'm awful like that. Um, if you like podcasts and you do because you're listening to one, uh, you might want to try 80s all over. Uh, it is a podcast uh, hosted by Drew McQueenie uh, and Scott Weinberg, uh, some of the most well-known film critics uh, on the Internet since the Internet first started talking about movies. Uh, they have come together and decided that they are going to review every major film of the 1980s one month at a time in order. Um, and they just started 1982. Um, you won't hear me talking on that one, which is already a bonus for some of you listening. Uh, I just produce it, but, uh, it's a really interesting archeological cinematic deep dive. Um, and And it's awesome. Oh yeah. And so, uh, I think by the time this episode comes out, will have just started 1982. So you've got two years worth 24 months worth of 1980 films to listen to. Um, and then, you know, once you catch up, you, you know, hang out in real time uh, as Scott and Drew uh, just plow through the amazing film decade that was the 1980s. Which is such a really cool concept. Anyway, I highly recommend that podcast. We'll have links to all of these things in the show notes. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to and supporting Coffee with Kenobi and for contributing to Star Wars Conversation. We will be back next week with two new co-hosts and more Star Wars talk. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.